Hello and welcome to the scientist.com webinar Overcoming Challenges in the UK Biobanking Part 2 Three Practical Approaches presented in collaboration with the UK CRC Tissue Directory and Coordination Centre. Today I'm going to give a brief introduction followed by presentations on three different approaches to help biobanks increase access to their samples in a transparent and compliant manner. Our fantastic panel consists of Alison Parry-Jones, Operations Director and Samples Manager at Wales Cancer Bank, Dr Phil Quinlan, Director of the UK CRC TDCC, and myself. After the presentations, we'll have a question and answer section to give you the opportunity to engage directly with the panel. So please feel free to type your questions into the QA box at the bottom of your screen as you think of them, and we'll be sure to answer as many of them as possible. My name is Matt McLaughlin. I'm VP of Compliance and Categories at Scientist.com. I've been involved in drug research and discovery for the past 20 years. And prior to my role at Scientist.com, I was a scientist at AstraZeneca within the R&D genetics and personalized healthcare departments before moving into a procurement organization where I was responsible for the global strategy of sample acquisition. Within my role at Scientist.com, I'm responsible for the creation of our award-winning Comply platform that supports most of the world's large pharmaceutical companies access human samples from commercial and academic biobanks. I also lead a team of experts who support researchers on a daily basis to identify and source the resources they need to drive their experiments forward. Scientist.com is a software solution to support scientific research founded in 2007. We're headquartered in San Diego and we have offices all over the world, including the UK and Japan. We currently have approximately 60 full-time employees supporting over 80 biopharmaceutical companies, academic institutions, and over 3,300 suppliers in more than 4,000 different research areas. Our role is to act as a third-party facilitator. We are not a distributor, nor do we subcontract services or samples. All parties retain full control over who they work with and what they do within our platform. I thought it would be a good idea to briefly recap our first webinar, which took place in April. For part one, we brought together key stakeholders within UK biobanking landscape, including the patient advocacy movement, Use My Data, the Medicines Discovery Catapult, and our co-host today, the UK CRC. A key theme to emerge in the webinar was that the panelists felt that non-use of donated tissue is misuse. There was a discussion around who holds the responsibility for ensuring tissue is discoverable and used, and also the barriers that researchers face when sourcing samples and how the community could overcome these. If you haven't seen part one, then this will be available via the scientist.com website. So it's my absolute pleasure to do an introduction for each of the speakers today. Our first speaker today is Alison Parry-Jones. Alison is the designated individual on the Wales Cancer Bank license issued by the Human Tissue Authority and is therefore responsible for governance and compliance across all Wales Cancer Bank sites in Wales. She has extensive project management experience in academia and is PRINCE2 registered practitioner. Her background is in analytical chemistry and before moving into project management, she worked in bioanalytical laboratories specializing in phase one and two clinical research. Her interest in the legal and ethics issues within biobanking led her to complete an MA in medical ethics and law in 2012. She is the director at large for the Europe, Middle East and Africa region of ISBA is a member of an American Society of Clinical Pathology Board of Certification working group that recently developed an international qualification in biorepository science online. After Alison will be Phil, Phil Quinlan. Phil's main responsibilities are to oversee the strategic direction of the UK CRC TDCC and to ensure delivery on its mission and objectives. The team works to maximize the use, value, and impact of the UK's human sample resources, helping ensure that UK biobanks are visible to the research community. The field is quite complex with a wide range of stakeholders, and part of his role is to ensure that we understand the various needs and concerns of the community, as well as potential opportunities. His background is in application development and data analytics with a PhD in AI and health informatics. His expertise is around data systems and data integration to assist biobanks in connecting to the wider world. And with that, I'm now going to turn over to Alison for the first set of presentations. Thank you very much. Thanks, Matt, and thanks for the introduction. Um, so today, I just wanted to give you a brief insight into some of the ways that we at the Wales Cancer Bank have addressed just some of the challenges that we faced. First, I think it's important to say that not all biobanks are the same. 
So whilst there will be a lot of challenges that we have in common, some of these solutions may not necessarily be relevant to all, depending on how biobanks were set up, why they were set up, and the metrics that they have. So as a brief introduction, the Wales Cancer Bank was always to be a prospective collection of samples from cancer patients. So we weren't set up to support a specific research project, rather we were there to be a resource for cancer researchers around the world. We receive grant funding and we operate a cost recovery process to offset some of the costs involved in supplying the services to the research community. But one thing most biobanks have in common, especially at the moment, is the drive for sustainability. Sustainability in biobanking is not only financial, although clearly this is a very important part of it, but there's also operational sustainability. Are we collecting the right samples? Are the processes lean, etc.? That all plays an important role, as does social sustainability. That encompasses all stakeholder groups, and for biobanking, there are many. We have donors, researchers, funders, healthcare providers, staff, etc. And together, these three elements all feed into working towards a sustainable biobanking model. So the webinar a couple of weeks ago identified some of the challenges in biobanking, but I started to make my own list. Although I did have to stop because it was getting rather long. So today, I'm just going to focus on these three. So to start with visibility. For a biobank to connect with the research community, they have to be visible. We started by having a website that had a for researchers section, and then we added a search function so researchers could quickly see if the samples of interest were in the archive. We do also collect samples to order, and we have a dedicated email address for researchers to contact us to discuss their requirements as well. We wanted to expand our visibility, so we're also on directories listings, such as the UK CRC Tissue Directory, ISPA's International Repository Locator and BBMRI's Biobank Directory and we're also on the scientist.com platform. One difficulty we found is in finding out when papers have been published on research that's been used from, uh, from the Cancer Bank and this is an important metric for us to capture. So we wrote a paper for the Journal of Bioresources that then gives us a DOI that researchers can use to acknowledge the Wales Cancer Bank in publications. That makes it a lot easier for us to search if we have to go looking for these publications, but it also refers others to our resource. So all of these resources are great, but they're only of use if researchers know of their existence and know how to access them. Biobanks can advertise on all of these sites and there are probably far more out there, but unless the sites themselves are well advertised, it doesn't actually take us any further forward. But moving on to patient expectations. I put the scales picture here purposely, as I do believe we have to carefully balance expectations with reality in order not to promise what we cannot achieve. I would love to be able to promise every donor that every sample they donate will be used, but I simply can't. As a prospective generic collection, we can't foresee, at least with any great accuracy, the requests that are going to come into us from researchers. But building an archive is valuable, and this has been evident recently when we were asked for serum samples um, to use as controls for COVID-19 work. We had more than enough in our freezers to satisfy the researchers' needs, which wouldn't have been possible if we'd only ever collected samples for specific research. Actually, that highlights another useful quality, being flexible. We wanted to be able to support the COVID work, but our ethics only allowed for release of samples for cancer-related research. So right at the beginning of lockdown, we submitted an amendment to ethics to allow release of samples for public health emergencies. But the patient voice is very important to us. We've had a patient group from the very beginning and they're there to advise us on all matters and to consult on new initiatives such as lay consenting and electronic consenting. We have lay representation on all committees involved in running the Wales Cancer Bank and they review the lay summaries in the applications we receive to ensure that plain English is used and hopefully that those lay summaries are actually understandable. We try and get as much information as we can out to the public and patients via newsletters and websites and as many means as we can. Moving on to researcher expectations, these can be tricky. I think we've probably all had the request for a couple of grams of tissue or 50 mils of blood. And I think this is down to education. Most researchers accessing samples are completely naive of the clinical processes and that, for example, biopsies are so small that we'll be lucky to persuade the histopathologist to give the biobank any at all. So we instigated roadshows and clinics at our various local departments to try and give researchers basic information. 
We also have a one-to-one -one application consultation process so that the researcher has a dedicated WCB member of staff to help advise on application contact before it goes out to reviewers. This will hopefully expedite the review process. And actually the review process is another thing for, uh, for researchers to understand why we need to review, which is to confirm the deemed ethics, and the fact that the turnaround times are not necessarily going to be Amazon-like. The expectation that these services should be free is also a familiar issue, especially with academic researchers. We decided to introduce pilot projects for applications that required fewer than 20 samples as a proof of concept. We supply these pilot projects free of charge unless highly processed material is required. And there is an expectation that larger sample sets will be requested in future should the pilot work be successful. And we have had a couple of pilots converted into full applications. So that was really a whistle stop tour of some of the approaches we've employed to try and address just a few of the challenges. There are many pieces to this puzzle and to successfully navigate the maze of competing priorities, biobanks need to consider different strategies and ultimately see what works at a given time for them. Thank you. I'm now going to hand over to Phil. Thanks very much, Alison. Um, and also just picking up on the point you just made in your, your talk there, thank you also very much for being so flexible in the current situation with COVID. So having Wales Cancer Bank being able to access their archives has been extremely valuable for, for us. So thank you for that as well. And thank you everybody for joining. Uh, it's good to see so many here for the second uh, of, the, of the series. Um, so thank you for coming. So if you uh, were in on the first one, you, you probably saw this already, uh, but just a very quick recap. Uh, we were set up in uh, 2014 based on this funders vision based uh, from 2011. And really this was around the funders wanting to make sure samples that were collected had uh, as much use as possible. So we were really there to make them discoverable and trying to make sure there's a reduction in duplication of effort. So really that means that existing resources are used more and uh, there's a reduction in, in samples being collected uh, just on their own. Um, the other thing we're trying to do is also connect this into uh, increasing the value of samples, and that generally means by making sure they can be uh, linked to clinical data. Uh, so we've got a role within Health Data Research UK as well to try and make that happen. The main vehicle that we have for doing this is the tissue directory, as you, you've heard from Alison that she's registered. And that's how we try and make uh, biobanks more discoverable in the UK. And uh, today we're going to be featuring a little bit more about what we've done on the directory, how to use it, but also how we've integrated that with the scientist platform. Again, a very quick summary. Uh, so we have about 200 uh, sample resources in the UK uh, scattered nearly across every single city. So we have a good coverage here. And something that's really quite important if you are a research tissue bank, it'll also be a condition of your ethics from the UK bodies to make sure that you are registered with us if, you, if you're going through that permission. And the reason for that is really around transparency, to make sure if you are collecting samples as a research tissue bank, that you can be found and can be discovered. So I mentioned this very briefly last time, but I want to spend a little bit more on this. So we, we launched uh, the transparency principles at our showcase event last year in Nottingham. And the reason we did this was because we're, we're really quite worried about the perception uh, biobanks and researchers have about organizations such as scientists. There is this fear that as a biobank you won't know who the researcher is, you won't have any control over it. There's something a little bit murky going on because you can't have that visibility. And that's maybe a reputation from business models that existed uh, when, when certain companies started up a, a decade or so ago. But not everybody operates like that. And so we're worried that this blanket opinion was actually preventing people from connecting to platforms that did allow direct contact and did allow people to speak directly to the end user and find out exactly what they want and put them through exactly the same process that every other researcher would go through. So one of the reasons we did this transparency principles was to reach out to companies such as scientists to say, we commit to these principles to demonstrate your willingness to have transparency around who the end user is, what they're going to use the samples for, the fact that the biobank will be acknowledged for that use and making sure that's traced through. But really importantly, also making sure the patient can be cited in the publication. So it's important that both the biobank and the end users are, are able to communicate and that allows them to acknowledge each other. And that obviously means there must be transparency there. 
So we're really pleased that Scientist was the first uh, in, uh, entity to actually sign up to the transparency principles. But this is why we did it. We wanted to make sure that as people approach biobanks beyond different platforms, they understood if they were complying uh, to the statements made in these transparency principles to be a bit of a, a segregation between different companies. Um, so thank you very much to scientists for doing that. Uh, and it's really good that we have these principles now and, and different companies are signing up. You can find more details about all the companies that have gone there and uh, a biobank that has signed up on, on our website. So now I'm gonna talk you through, just going through um, the, the, the ability to find samples. So if you could start the video for me. So if you go to Google and type in UK tissue directory, uh, I don't know how biased these results are, but when I did it, I came out top, which is nice to see. Um, so clicking on the tissue directory link will take us through to our main page. If you know of a particular disease that you're after, you can type it in that box, but you don't have to. You can just hit search straight away or to give you a list of every single biobank. Once you get there, you can then get a list of all them that are there. You can do some additional filters on the left and you can kind of build up a bit of a shopping list. So you can hit the, the blue add to contact list button and then you can get through and talk to the biobanks. Our role isn't to get involved in any of the access procedures or to uh, say whether samples should or should not be released. We're purely there to bring visibility. But what we don't want to do is complicate the process by meaning that once you found the biobank, that it's then a real struggle to get access to different systems. And as if by magic, Wales Cancer Biobank is now the one I found in the video. So I want to find out a little bit more. You can kind of click on the card and get a bit, bit more information about exactly the types of samples they have from which age groups, from which genders, and uh, the, the temperatures have been stored at this type of thing. So if you think you want to talk to the Wales Cancer Bank, you can then go up to the top, hit the button to add to contact list and then view contact list. And what that allows you to do is, is to get their email address. So if you want to talk to Alison directly, we're now showing her email address on screen. Um, but also if you wanted to go through the scientist platform, you can just click on the, the button there. You'll get our little disclaimer that we're now passing you through to a third party system. And boom, you'll then be right into the scientist platform. So we've really tried to make the integration work. And this fits with everything that we do. We, we don't want biobanks having to register with us and then having to go through various different processes with different people. So the easier we can make it to be interoperable with different systems and different processes to assist in more samples being used, we will do that. So finally, just some, some calls to action, I guess. Um, from the biobank perspective, we really need to make sure that we are engaging effectively with industry. And I think part of that is actually to challenge the perception that the public doesn't support industry access to samples. It's said quite a lot to us that, that this is the case, but we don't often see, see that once we talk to patient groups and we, we explain the role that industry has. Now, <laughs> sorry, Matt, this doesn't mean that we have to have everybody on the scientist platform. Um, Obviously, it's, it's a good platform. They've signed up for our transparency principles, and so they're, they're one of the, the good people in the system. <clears throat> but if you don't sign up to scientists, we will be asking the question, how are you going to make industry able to access your sample collections? And what are you doing to try and make that easier? Uh, and with that, I'll end. Thank you very much. And back to Matt. Thanks, Phil. And also, Alison, actually, they're, they're both very informative questions. One thing I just I want to remind everybody is if you do have any questions from either of those presentations or the, the presentation that I'm about to give, then, then please feel free to submit those through the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, but earlier, I gave a brief intro to, to who scientists.com are. Um, but now I would like to give you more details on what we've been doing to support access to samples. And, and hopefully this will complement nicely what, what Phil just showed there. And first, I think it's important to, to emphasize the importance of human biological samples within the drug discovery process. Without access to relevant samples and the medicines we all require to combat the diseases of today and tomorrow, we severely hindered. As you know, new medicines are developed by a range of organizations. They can come from academia, small biotechs, through to large pharmaceutical companies. And who invents or develops these medicines should not determine who can access the samples. As a community, I believe the primary role we all have is to ensure that donated samples get to where they are needed the most and will have the most impact. 
Due to the demands of getting new medicines approved, it's vital that researchers can access samples quickly. They represent the relevant population and they're sourced in compliance with all applicable laws and regulations. However, as you know, that's not as easy as it sounds. And this is one of the things that we've been looking to support. The diagrams intended to represent how complex the custody chain of a sample can be. Researchers can access from biobanks directly, they can access from commercial providers. Commercial providers can sometimes provide to other commercial providers who then provide it to the researchers. And ensuring that someone isn't accessing the same sample from two different sources can sometimes be quite difficult. I think this is where those transparency principles that Phil was talking about is really critical. But then you have to add on the complexity of working with industry directly. These companies tend to have long due diligence processes that need to be completed before they can even work with the source. They have long contracts that need to be established. All in all, there's a lot to do and it can lead to a painful experience. However, that's only half the story. Within biobanks, you have your own challenges. This table is a brief summary of the internal challenges we've seen biobanks have had to overcome. It's, it's no, by no means exhaustive, but hopefully as you go look through this, you'll, you'll recognize some of these. You know, these challenges could be going through your own internal approval process before you can offer the samples. It could be trying to access legal support to put in place a contract, something I think that most biobanks feel under supported with, as you have to rely on your central contracting groups of the institution you work for, who may not understand your model or even the area that you're working in. Or it could be aligning with the institution's requirements around ownership or publication of the results um, of the research that's been conducted, something that may conflict with the needs of the researcher. As such, when you look at both sides of the situation, you can see there's a lot of administration, a lot of duplication of effort, and again, leads to a poor experience. So what can we do to solve this? When we reviewed everything that, um, that we'd seen, we realized that there was a role that we played as a third party facilitator when industry have been accessing services, which may actually be helpful within the sample space. Our aim is to provide a software that facilitates direct interactions between researchers and providers of samples in an efficient and effective manner. Again, I want to reiterate that we're not a commercial provider of samples. Our platform enables research organizations and biobanks to ensure all samples are requested, offered, provided and received according to your own internal policies and procedures. Ultimately, each side has transparency and control over who they work with. So for this reason, we've supported approximately 7,000 requests for samples over the past few years from researchers across the globe from over 240 different commercial and academic sources. So how did we do this? Well, to put it simply, back in 2016, when we looked at the whole process, we identified there was significant duplication that can be acting as a blocker for biobanks to work with industry. When we did that, we realized that if we simplified the due diligence, that industry requires of a biobank and we address the contractual challenges, then we could positively impact the situation without compromising the core concerns or requirements of either side. And to do that, what we created was called Comply. So Comply was launched in 2017 and it's a set of tools designed to, uh, to establish a rigorous compliance and governance framework to increase sample visibility, traceability and control. And what I mean by that is visibility in that we increase awareness of where samples are or who will require samples. Traceability as we move discussions out of emails into a system that tracks what was agreed and by whom and ultimately what it will be used for so that you as a biobank can determine whether the research that they want to conduct on the samples that you have aligns with the donor consents and your requirements. And finally control in that we ensure the right people on both sides approve the project or the offer or the request for samples before they're provided. However, it doesn't really explain what comply is. Comply is made up of three core areas. But as I say, that first is that service specific due diligence. So the due diligence that industry requires a provider, such as a biobank of samples, um, to complete before they work with them. What we did was we worked with, with a suite of suppliers, biobanks and industry to set a standard process. So that means that you can complete one due diligence form and that form will be used by all of the clients within scientist.com. They still may uh, can contact you for specific questions, but we're trying to strip out that duplication piece. Similarly, what we've done is we've developed a single agreement. The agreement has, again, been designed um, with industry's involvement, with providers' involvement, and is looking to remove the need to put in individual MTAs each time. 
It acts as a framework where you're able to agree challenge, uh, changes or amendments to that agreement directly with the client related to the requirements of your organizations. And then finally, um, we have our compliance manager functionality. And that's how we enable you to retain full control. The system is designed not to replace your internal approval process or really impact it in any way. The compliance manager tool is enabling you to be able to provide samples and maintain exactly what you need to do for your own institution um, to enable you to, to get those samples to the researcher's hands. I think what I really want to stress is that this isn't something that we're looking to build. This is something that we have built. It's already available today and we already have biobanks from across the globe working on the platform and providing samples. Some biobanks have provided lots of samples, others have provided none. And, and for us, that's absolutely fine as ultimately they control who they work with and what they offer. We don't want to remove visibility to who's re uh, requesting the samples, nor do we want to remove that control from the biobank of what they offer. Nor do we want to ask or, or require any exclusivity. The, the solution should be seen as a, to complement what you already do and provide you the opportunity to get samples into the hands of researchers who need them to deliver the medicines of tomorrow. So I want to finish by saying that we want to ensure that any sample provided is one that the biobank is happy to provide. We also want to do this in a way that's sustainable and that is why you can use our software to support your biobank and incur no costs. You can run it completely cost neutral. We don't ask you to pay a license fee. We're not asking you to pay to play in effect. For us, we think we've developed a new way of working for Biobank so that you can increase the visibility and accessibility of your samples and stay in full control. So with that, I'd like to, to bring the presentation section of the um, webinar today to an end. Uh, thank you once again to both of the speakers for their presentations. And we're gonna move into the Q&A section. And I can see that we've already had a few questions that have come through. So with that, the first question um, is, are you concerned that patients do not support access to samples from industry? Um, and I'm gonna direct that to Alison, if that's okay. Thank you, Matt. Uh, so I don't think so particularly. I mean, we haven't found that it has been a concern of patients. I mean, it's very clear in our information sheet um, that samples can go out to any uh, to any sector, be that academic or be that industry, we are very um, we're very keen that we're supporting the best science, regardless of, of where that is being carried out. Um, and I think there is an appreciation that actually it's going to be industry where new drugs and treatments are going to come from, and certainly that the cancer cohort of patients who are who are the patients that we're very involved with um, understand that. And we certainly haven't had. Um, I think if we've had any, it's been one or two who have potentially objected to samples being used in that way. Um, just to say we don't have a tiered or an optional consent. So if the patient is uncomfortable um, with potential commercial use, um, then we wouldn't actually consent that patient. It's, uh, we, we looked on it as, as being it, uh, administratively very difficult to start having a tiered level of consent but we certainly haven't found that it's been a major barrier to um, to patients consenting. Phil from your side I know you speak to a lot of biobanks do you have anything from your side that you'd like to add? No uh, the only thing to add really is just to to reference the joint work that was done by the HRA and HTA um, and it was a really interesting piece of work there because um, what, what they did was they, they asked the question first, do you support uh, industry access to samples? And, and the answer was no. Um, but then when they delved a bit deeper, there were, it was exceptions, right? So by industry, they, they weren't thinking purely pharmaceutical or um, that type, but maybe uh, insurance companies or those types of industries. So once it was explained around um, the specific type of industry that might need access to samples, they were actually very supportive. And so I think that's where we need to have, make sure we get the debate right when we talk about, in quotes, industry, uh, because I think you can get very different uh, answers depending on how you ask that question when you, when you talk to the public. So it's important that we reinforce that message that a lot of the um, development in this area is from industry um, and, and we need to support their access to samples. Thank you both. So had another couple of questions through. Uh, Phil, this one's going to, uh, actually the next two, I think, and we're going to set you up for, for two here. Uh, the first one, is it a requirement for those registered with the UKCRC to make samples available to commercial companies? 
No, it's not. Um, the when you register, you can actually say that you are currently not able to accept requests from industry. Um, our main drive those transparency so that if you are stating you do are, and are able to have those requests that you then do fulfill them. So um, yeah, you can you can register in the directory and say you're closed to absolutely everybody if you want to. Um, but so that but the but the aim of the directory is to make sure you're visible so at least it's known that you are collecting samples even if you can't make them available to certain groups. And to follow on from that um, a little, uh, the functionality of being able to email the relevant biobank manager on TDCC is great. But from personal experience, you can email the individual listed and never hear back. Is customer management something you look to focus on with biobanks? Yes, uh, indirectly. So we, we don't, obviously we don't know which biobanks are being contacted um, and we, we don't police that either. So we, we don't get involved in the access process. But if you are trying to contact biobanks and don't get replies, give us a shout, let us know. Um, we also have a chat function on the directory. So um, Katie's there currently. Um, so you can ping a question in there if you have been struggling with getting access or people haven't been replying. We may be able to either check if that person still works there, which happens, which can be the case sometimes. Um, but also, we may have other sources of of biobanks that might be able to help you. So, use the chat function, get in touch with us if you're having those types of problems. One of the things I will add is that from the the just to, to, to speak on scientists' behalf, one of the the features of the platform that we look to offer is um, a research concierge service. So um, it works; it supports both the biobanks and the the researcher side. So if if there is a uh, either a delay or a breakdown in communication, someone isn't replying, um, we do have. Um, research concierges who will reach out for you uh, and try to prompt responses and chase on your behalf so that you can focus on the research or focus on running the biobank kind of thing. Um, that's one of the benefits of the platform. Um, but then to, to Alison, oh, this, this one's going to head your way. Um, what proportion of requests you receive are pilots? And of the pilots, what actually move on to the full requests? And how do you work with regards to each stage and MTAs? Do you require a new one for each stage? Um, okay, so when we first introduced the pilots, they were very popular with our local researchers. Um, so we did have to start putting some rules in there, as in you can't have more than one pilot going at the same time so that you can't sneak your bigger project in through uh, multiple pilot projects. Um, so there's probably uh, maybe about 10%. Um, it, has, it has reduced down in the last year. I don't actually think we've had a pilot project application in the last year. Um, but it's probably about 10% of applications um, over the last few years have been, have been pilots. Um, only, I think it's two of those. Um, Lisa is probably screaming at the, at, at the webinar because <laughs> I think she's dialed in because um, she will know better than that but there's certainly a, a couple of them have have converted um, and yes they the, there is a separate um, MTA for each because they have been mostly from our local researchers then it's an internal memorandum of understanding rather than a full material transfer agreement but it would require a full MTA um, for for each stage of it. Thank you. And, and, and one of the things I think uh, I'd like to add is one of the, as I say, with the Alison there mentioned that she'd need to do one MTA for each day or potentially um, one of the benefits of the, the, the scientist.com platform that we try to develop is, is to remove that. So working under that framework agreement, you would simply work, whether it's a pilot or whether it's a full project, you'd be a, we're trying to support it so that you work under the same terms. Um, you would just, it would be done under the statement of work that is submitted where you're able to vary requirements and things like that. Uh, this this question is going to go to to the to both of you actually it's uh, quite a broad one but um, what are the key metrics that demonstrate biobank success utility uh, to its funders? So maybe Alison, could you if you've got any sort of um, perspective from your biobank perspective and Phil more from the community perspective um, that may be a nice way to answer it. Sure, um, metrics are always. A difficult one. Um, I think partly because a lot of biobanks are set up within academia, which then puts very academic type metrics on them, which are not necessarily 
the most appropriate ones for biobanks who are acting as a service, as an infrastructure, which personally I think biobanks should be. They should be there to, to service research rather than actually do the research themselves. So certainly I would say we, that metrics would be what the, the number and the type of projects that the biobank supplies, um, what type of science the, biobanking, the biobank is supporting, um, and ultimately how that translates into patient benefit, um, whether that's through new diagnostic tests, um, new treatments, um, or, or new, new pathways. Uh, it is difficult because as biobanks evolve, their metrics do, uh, do tend to change. Certainly when you're, when you're starting off, one of your main metrics, um, if you're a prospective collection, is, is how many samples um, have you collected? How many patients have you consented? Um, but I do think the important, uh, the important metric here is, is the science that is supported and how that ultimately translates into patient benefit, which does mean they're mid to long term benefits. This is, and that can sometimes be difficult for funders. Um, and it's not something that you would necessarily turn around in a, in a typical three year funding period, which again, I will hark back to why I think biobanks should be supported in a different way. They should be um, set up as an infrastructure um, support rather, rather than relying on academic type funding, but I'm, I'm changing the argument here slightly. But no, I do think it is the, the science that's supported and how that will ultimately um, benefit patients. Phil, do you have anything from a sort of, I guess, more of a the, the community perspective you, when you've been in discussions with the, the biobanks that are listed on the, the UK directory? Um, have they brought anything, any other points up? No, I think Alison gave a very uh, good answer there. And I, I think particularly that point about how it can transition between different phases. Right. Um, and also this, this aspect of how do we fund infrastructure um, and... The, the challenge there is that a lot of the funding comes from research charities and councils, but they're used to research, not necessarily infrastructure. And so how you get the right mix of funding uh, is important because that drives the metrics as well in terms of what they may expect to see. So, um, yeah, I think Alison did a brilliant job at that one. So we, the next question um, is, do you, um, so this, is, this one's to, to myself actually, do you li uh, liaise directly with the institution's legal department to develop MTA contracts and the same with the researchers end? Um, in short, yes. So the way that, the, the way that we've established our contracts is that um, every single researcher who joins the platform agrees to our, uh, our human biological sample supply agreement. So the organizations, whether they are uh, small biotechs, academia, or, or massive multinational pharmaceutical companies, they've all agreed to a core set of terms and conditions. Um, with regards to the biobank side, um, part of the process that we go through is support and, and uh, entering into communications with the legal departments, as well as the biobanks around the contractual terms and the contractual structure to make sure all requirements are addressed. Um, now the way we've done that is that there is a, a standard set of terms and conditions. Um, if a buyer bank already has a direct contractual relationship with an organization then that contractual relationship will apply and if they don't and they need to vary a terms they can actually do that through each for each individual project. Um, so you have although there is a standard contractual uh, contractual um, document, you can you still have flexibility to ensure that they aligns with the, the institution's requirements. Um, and I think that's one of the big big benefits of the of the platform is if we can look to remove um, the the, the cost associated with establishing these MTAs or establishing these contracts and still give you that full control and that direct contractual relationship, we can actually make um, the process of offering samples much quicker uh, and much easier for both sides. So the, the next question, just conscious of time, um, is back to, to Alison and Phil. I'm not sure which one of you want to tackle this one. Um, what is the regulatory landscape in the UK regarding reuse of samples? Do tissue banks require research project proposal submission for sample or data release? Is the reuse subject to a new ethical approval? It's, uh, I'll take that start off with. So I think the, the general framework um, is that a, a organization can apply to be a research tissue bank. Um, 
to the uh, HRAs, the, the Health Research Authority. Um, and then somebody applying, yes, would normally have to supply a, a kind of request in terms of what they need the samples for and the purpose and this type of thing. Um, but then if you're an uh, a RTB, so Research Tissue Bank, the requester doesn't need ethics themselves, so they can kind of come under the ethics that they've applied for. Um, so generally that's quite flexible. Um, Alison might want to add a couple more things there. Um, no, not really. As I say, we, uh, the, as you say, the ethics that we have allows us to confer deemed ethics for um, researchers when their application goes through our review process. So our process very much is looking at the science. Is it good science? Is it a good use of the samples? Um, we will, uh, we try only to issue the minimum amount of sample needed for the research so that the um, researcher doesn't have excess sample um, at, the, uh, at the end of their work. And if there is any request um, for further work or for collaborators to join in with the work that they're doing, we would require notification of that um, so that we can ensure that that is still within the limits of the, of the consent that the patient gave originally. Just conscious of time, so that we will wrap up after this question. Obviously, um, given the current situation, it would be remiss not to at least ask one question with re regards to COVID-19. Um, so has anything changed in respect to getting and accessing samples and data um, in the current climate and, and anything uh, and connected to that, um, specifically COVID-19 samples? Um, well, if we have actually... Um, had to stop consenting patients. Um, so our biobank is on complete pause at the moment. Uh, we haven't consented a patient since I think it's something like the 18th of, of March, um, partly because of uh, access to patients. Um, there's, there's been a lot of movement now with, uh, with the cancer patients, either being uh, having telephone consultations or surgery being moved. So we're actually finding it very uh, very difficult to to access patients, and we had the one of the first issues we had because we do supply quite a f uh, quite a few projects with fresh tissue samples straight from from the operating theatre. Um, we'll go through histology first, um, and histology uh, our local histology department um, put a stop on any fresh tissue coming in for for safety reasons. Um, so we're actually not consenting at the moment and we are not collecting samples. So um, we are not in a position to to collect any COVID related samples at the moment. Phil, have you seen uh, seen any impact with regards to use of the platform, etc? We have seen um, a significant amount of biobanks that are currently closed for exactly the reasons that Alison has just mentioned. So we, we know that is is very constrained at the moment. Um, if you are trying to get samples for COVID, uh, you can go onto the Biobanking UK website. Um, and we're trying to keep information up there and blogs up there about what the current status is because it is, it is just changing so quickly at the moment. Um, so yeah, uh, it's a very tough environment, I think, for the moment for Biobanks. So to, to give you an idea, about 70, 75% of the Biobanks we're aware of are currently closed. From, from our side, obviously, we, we support global access, so, so we have seen um, a, a little bit of an impact. Um, the number, sort of like the, the requests for samples um, are still there. They're still being submitted by researchers um, in various different locations. Um, we've noticed that uh, there's still companies and still biobanks able to provide their, their existing repositories of samples. And then we've also been tracking which suppliers and which biobanks have access to COVID-19 specifically where they're located um, to support researchers in, in identification of those and, and connecting them to those sources so that they can discuss potential access as well. So we've obviously seen it an increase in the number of COVID-19 requests and the number of COVID-19 samples that are being provided. Um, but that hasn't, we, we haven't necessarily seen a diminish on the, the existing requests that, that are non-COVID-19 related. So with the given time, etc., I think we, we've, we've just gone over um, the allotted uh, piece. So with that, I would like to take one um, opportunity to thank you all for the questions today. 
uh, and we're going to go ahead and wrap up the webinar. Uh, thank you so much to all of our presenters for, for sharing their, their knowledge and time today. If you've got any additional questions or you'd like to get in touch with us, our contact information is available on the slide. Um, this webinar was also recorded and will be available later for listening. So with that, thank you so much for joining scientist.com and the UK CRC TDCC, and we wish you all a safe, relaxing rest of your week. <laughs>